video is an intimate storytelling medium. And when it bonds with one of the finest storytellers of our times, the result is sheer magic. During these times of social distancing, All India Radio hopes to bring you some comfort, some connection, with an exclusive story reading series, Bonding Over the Radio. Coming up is the pick of the day, voiced by the author Ruskin Bond himself. I'm going to read chapter 6 from The Blue Umbrella, which is a storybook of mine. It, it actually runs to about half an hour if I read the entire story. But I'll tell you a, a bit about it beforehand. It's the story of a village girl here, up here in the mountains. And she is attracted to a very pretty blue umbrella, which some tourists have while they're out picnicking on the hillside. And they are fascinated by a locket she's wearing, made uh, with a tiger's claw. And um, they, they, then they exchange these objects. So Binia, the girl, she gets the blue umbrella she fancies, and she gives away the locket. And this umbrella, which is very pretty, becomes the envy of everyone in her village. Because nobody has such a pretty umbrella. And it's particularly the village shopkeeper, Ram Barossa, he, he really covets it and he wants it badly. And he goes to extreme lengths to try to get it, he even gets a, bribes a small boy to try to steal it. But Binya manages to hang on to her umbrella until finally one day everybody has a sort of change of heart. And this is what happens. By early October... The rains were coming to an end. The leeches disappeared. The ferns turned yellow, and the sunlight on the green hills was mellow and golden, like the limes on the small tree in front of Binya's home. Her brother Biju's days were happy ones as he came home from school munching on roasted corn. Binya's umbrella had turned a pale milky blue, and was patched in several places, but it was still the prettiest umbrella in the village, and she still carried it with her wherever she went. The cold, cruel winter wasn't far off, but somehow October seems longer than other months, because it is a kind month. The grass is good to be upon, the breeze is warm and gentle and pine-scented, that October, everyone seemed contented. Everyone, that is, except Ram Barossa. The old man had by now given up all hope of ever possessing Binya's umbrella. He wished he had never set eyes upon it. Because of the umbrella, he had suffered the tortures of greed, the despair of loneliness. Because of the umbrella, people had stopped coming to his shop. Ever since it had become known that Ram Barossa had tried to have the umbrella stolen, the village people had turned against him. They stopped trusting the old man. Instead of buying their soap and tea and matches from his shop, they preferred to walk an extra mile to the shops near the bus stand. Who would have dealings with a man who had sold his soul for an umbrella? The children taunted him twisted his name around. From Ram the Trustworthy, he became trusty umbrella thief. The old man sat alone in his empty shop, listening to the eternal hissing of his kettle and wondering if anyone would ever again step in for a glass of tea. Ram Barossa had lost his own appetite and ate and drank very little. There was no money coming in. He had his savings in a bank in Terry, but it was a terrible thing to have to dip into them. To save money, he had dismissed the blundering Rajaram. So he was left without any company. The roof leaked and the wind got in through the corrugated tin sheets, but Ram Barossa didn't care. Biju and Binia passed his shop almost every day. Biju went by with a loud but tuneless whistle. 
He was one of the world's whistlers. Kez rested lightly on his shoulder. But, strangely enough, Binya crept quietly past the shop, looking the other way, almost as though she was in some way responsible for the misery of Rambarosa. She kept reasoning with herself, telling herself that the umbrella was her very own and that she couldn't help it if others were jealous of it. But had she loved the umbrella too much? Had it mattered more to her than people mattered? She couldn't help feeling that in a small way she was the cause of the sad look on Ram Barossa's face. His face is a yard long, said Bidu. It was all due to his own greed, no doubt, but she didn't want him to feel too bad about what he'd done because it made her feel bad about herself. And so she closed the umbrella whenever she came near the shop, opening it again only when she was out of sight. One day towards the end of October, when she had ten paise in her pocket, she entered the shop and asked the old man for a toffee. She was Ram Barossa's first customer in almost two weeks. He looked suspiciously at the girl. Had she come to taunt him, to flaunt the umbrella in his face? She had placed her coin on the counter. Perhaps it was a bad coin. Ram Barossa picked it up and bit it. He held it up to the light. He rang it on the ground. It was a good coin. He gave Binya the toffee. Binya had already left the shop when Ram Barossa saw the closed umbrella lying on his counter. There it was, the blue umbrella he had always wanted, within his grasp at last. He had only to hide it at the back of his shop, and no one would know that he had it. No one could prove that Binya had left it behind. He stretched out his trembling, bony hand and took the umbrella by the handle. He pressed it open. He stood beneath it in the dark shadows of his shop where no sun nor rain could ever touch it. But I'm never in the sun or in the rain, he said aloud. Of what use is an umbrella to me? And he hurried outside and ran after Binya. Binya, Binya, he shouted. You've left your umbrella behind. He wasn't used to running, but he caught up with her, held out the umbrella, saying, You forgot it, the umbrella. In that moment, it belonged to both of them. But Binya didn't take the umbrella. She shook her head and said, You keep it. I don't need it anymore. But, but it's such a, Beautiful umbrella, protested Rambarosa. It's the best umbrella in the village. I know, said Binya. But an umbrella isn't everything. And she left the old man holding the umbrella and went tripping down the road and there was nothing between her and the bright blue sky. Are you ready for some responses from the listeners? Yes, certainly. Okay. I'll begin with 23-year-old Sanchita, who has sent in a very beautiful sketch of your sir reading to us and holding the receiver with the, your one hand and yes. reading from Tigers for Dinner with the book in the other hand. And we have forwarded it to you, sir. Have you received it? Thank you uh, very much. It's on Rakesh's phone. And I'm asking him to preserve it for me, to blow it up, so I can keep it as a memento of these readings that I've uh, done with you. So, Sanchita, I hope you are listening in. And uh, Sanchita says, when I was in school, I had a yes. personal ritual where every time my exams got over, I would accompany my father, a teacher, to yes. a school library with at least two empty bags and return with them full of as many of your books as I could find. No. On our way back home, we almost struggled to carry the overloaded bags. Oh, but I would feel like the happiest person on earth. Mm. This trip to my father's library and your books, which provided warmth for my winter break, are one of the happiest memories of my childhood. While listening to you on radio, I feel transported back in time 
like my school exams have just got over and it's winter break all over again. It's good to know. I've given you uh, some pleasure over the years off and on and, and hope to continue to do so whenever a chance occurs. So there is yes. Adarsh Bhaskar Vasistha writing from Exeter, southwest of the UK. Uh, Tom Alter, in his preface to your masterpiece, The Room on the Roof, has written, Green and dying in the fern hill of the Dune Valley, may the chains from which Ruskin sings never break. Now he has a question. Yes. Oh, Mr. Bond, he had echoed our feelings in those words. Can you please share with us some fond memories of Tom Alter Saab? Oh, of Tom, yes. I'd love to. He spent so much of his life actually in Mumbai because he was working in films that uh, he didn't come to uh, Missouri all that much although his home was here and uh, whenever he did come he used to drop in at my place and he was always full of ideas. He did in fact write a couple of books too and very enthusiastic about um, his work about acting and films and uh, he loved India he taking Indian citizenship, and he'd sort of grown up on Hindi movies, and he, it was his ambition to act in them, and uh, he did even, he was always ready to take sort of roles that were perhaps unheroic, but he nevertheless gave it everything. Mm -hmm. So he was a good chap, and a fine actor too. And he even acted as Ruskin Bond. Oh yes, he did, uh, although he certainly, he was better looking than me and <laughs> taller than me too. <laughs> So we'll move on to Sriyanta from Chennai, Achha. who's actually written a short poem. Right. I'll read a bit from it. Got acquainted with Binya when I was aged 10. As she walked about with a blue umbrella, I tagged along enchanted by the words from your pen. And last stanza is, now at the end of every day, as a family we congregate, to hear you read the story of the day, thrilled if it's a tale we could recollect. Well, uh, thank you, and uh, I enjoy reading out my stories, and I'm glad that uh, there's been such a good response. Hmm? Sir, we move on to Samina from Bangalore, who writes, I'm closer to 40 than most people listening to Bonsa. But Bonsa has been such an integral part of my childhood, my nostalgia, and my faint attempts at writings that he feels like a best friend to me. I met him once in Bangalore, but I was so tongue-tied with awe that I hardly uttered a word in front of him. Oh. I'll ask one question of him now. Yes. Has Bonsa ever been tongue-tied and with whom? Oh, tongue-tied. Let's me see. Well, uh, yeah, I, I'm not a very talkative person. Normally, I sometimes had to make a speech and had no idea what to say <laughs> and um, just bumble along. And uh, I have, a, I think I own the world record for the shortest speech ever made, which was probably about one minute. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I often get tongue-tied, you know, if I have to make a sort of speech. But reading I love, and um, I'm happy to read aloud, I'd, and even to answer questions. It's only, you know, a formal speech that I get tongue-tied. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I hope you've been enjoying this question and answers too, sir, just as I'm sure the listeners are. Well, I have enjoyed it, although sometimes the sound is make, creates problems for all of us. Yes. Missouri Telephone is, uh, this uh, virus seems to have got into it and creates problems now and then. Uh, but, um, but God bless the Missouri Telephone, <laughs> I'm sir. Going to, I'm going to dip it in a tub of water, this <laughs> telephone. <laughs> no, sir. This telephone has given us a lot of sucker, a yes. lot of warmth. Because under the circumstances now, we could <laughs> never have recorded you in a studio. Right. That was storyteller par excellence, Ruskin Bond, reading his hand-picked story of the day in our exclusive series, Bonding Over the Radio. A presentation of the Central English Features Unit. This came to you from the External Services Division of Orangia Radio.